Hello everyone, Sarah Kaki here from Atlanta Divorce Law Group. I am super excited to share this session with you guys with the co-founder and CEO of Rubicon Crypto, Greg Johnson. Um, today is going to be all about kind of removing our ignorance and understand a little bit more about uh, cryptocurrency, digital assets. And this is a caveat. This I'm calling this um, digital assets for dummies because I fall into that category myself. I feel very ignorant to these things. I feel like I need to learn more and understand more, especially um, not only personally because we live in an evolving world, but also as an attorney and founder of Atlanta Divorce Law Group, it is more, becoming more and more important that those of us in the legal profession are aware of these changing economical times so we can protect our clients' assets and especially a lot of our clients who may be married to a spouse or have a partner that is involved in digital assets and has digital assets. And you may feel like you're in the dark about this. So this is really for you. This is the evil level, the playing field um, for those of us who uh, woke up in 2022 and realized that digital assets has taken over the world. And now we want to get caught up. So Greg, thank you so much for joining me. Thank you for this time. And um, I'm, I'm so excited for you to kind of be our teacher through this. Well, you're welcome. I'm happy to be here. Hopefully I can help you put all the pressure of the world on me, but we'll see yeah. what we can do to deliver. I think we'll, I think we'll be able to help people out and maybe reset and, and have some fun doing it as well. So I'm looking forward to it. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. So yeah, let's, let's demystify some of this. Let's get the ABCs of digital assets. I feel okay. like every time I turn a corner, a new word's thrown at me and everybody pretends they know what they're talking about, but you ask a couple of questions and you're still unclear. So let's do the ABCs here. First sure. of all, what is cryptocurrency? Yeah. Yeah. Well, first of all, I, I, I want to say something, please, to anybody that's viewing this, you're not alone. This this is something where a lot of people still don't understand things. Uh, and I want to be very clear. Anybody who acts like they've got the market cornered on great ideas with crypto, please run away because we are talking about very exciting, very real uh, um, technologies that are that are changing the world. But it's early. It's very, very early. First of all, can I get a grievance out of the way? Would that be okay, Sarah? Because yeah, I hate, go for it. I personally, I personally, I can't stand the word. It's too late. The genie's out of the bottle. But the word cryptocurrency is a horrible catch-all phrase that really describes many very big industries within the crypto, blockchain, and digital asset world. But it's kind of what's stuck, and so we'll break it down. The first thing that I try to tell people that have no, no background in technology, all they're doing is really just hearing about it and, and getting exposed to it like so many of us have over the last several years is to realize and think about it this way. Human beings have always uh, wanted to you know, send messages between two parties in secret. So uh, for a lot of people who might be movie buffs, a very popular movie you might recall was The Da Vinci Code. And if you think about the Da Vinci Code, the central thing that was involved in that book and in the movie was what was called a cipher. And it was this, this device that if they, they didn't get it right, it would destroy the hidden message inside. And so if people can start to think of the crypto in cryptocurrency is really sending secret messages from one party to another. So our government has perfected ways to do that throughout the Cold War and really throughout history. There's a lot of really cool books about the American Revolution and the spies for General Washington sending secret messages. So the crypto in cryptocurrency, it really speaks to modern cryptography. That's the use of very powerful computers to be able to use code to send messages that we used to, you know, we used to send in secret ink or we used to use different types of code. It's just the evolution of being able to send messaging using computer code nowadays. And the second half of the word is currency. So it really describes how do we think about the evolution of money, right? From, you know, we used to barter with very heavy objects and lumps of, lumps of precious metal. And then we figured out as human beings, maybe we could make these fractional and look like coins and stamp them with people's faces and animals' heads on there and stuff. And then of course we have to credit the Chinese for the notion of paper money as a medium of exchange 
you get the idea. Now we use credit cards. Now we use our phones. And, and really, this is the evolution of money. But at its core, it's using the incredible advancements in sophisticated computer power. That's where it's all coming from. So that's, a, that's one thing to think about when you, when you think about cryptocurrency, sending things in secret, using code, and using it as a way to exchange as a currency. I know we're going to talk a lot more about it, but just think about that Da Vinci Code for a lot of you that are book readers or you like the movies, because I think that helps a lot of folks grasp kind of what we're talking about. So why don't you tell everyone why when they hear crypto, they're also hearing the term Bitcoin interchangeably? Oh, that's a great that's a great question. And it's and it's um, it's for good reason. Bitcoin, I think some people might might know this, but Bitcoin was the the original cryptocurrency and its origin story is fascinating. And the the timing of when it came into the world's uh, uh, you know, kind of view, it was not by accident. And it goes back to that first question you asked me a little bit. So bear with me for a second. You know, when the world was melting down during the Great Recession, I know it was 12, 13 years ago. And for uh, a good thing, we're human beings because we tend to suppress negative stimulus and memory uh, as a way for the species to survive. But I have to tell you, if you were in the financial services industry like I was back in those days, uh, working for big companies with uh, the traditional financial world, this was a very scary time. And when that happened, there were these really smart intellectuals um, that were had, had always been thinking this, but somebody came up with the idea to say, you know what, these big institutions, these big banks, these central governments, we trusted them. We give up fees for all of the things that we do with our money. We pay a fee for them to basically play by the rules and to show good judgment and to not take risks. And literally, they almost ran us off a cliff as a global economy. You know what? We don't have to do it that way anymore. And that was the big idea that launched Bitcoin, was this notion of we could create using computers, the now billions of people using computers, meaning the size of the network, and that coding, that advancement in, in uh, coding and cryptography we talked about earlier, we could shrink wrap all of those, those big ideas together. And actually the white paper in 2009, which became Bitcoin, was really talking about a new way to think about what's called a peer-to-peer -peer exchange of money. And that is what began the Bitcoin story. It was really about finding a way to use computers and something called blockchain, which is a subject we might get into a little bit, uh, as a way to say there are alternatives to needing a bank, needing a credit union, needing a government to say, you know what, Sarah does have this money in her bank account. We are going to approve it. Now give us a fee. Uh, we're going to send the money over to Greg from her account. Uh, it's there, Greg, now give us a fee. And the global financial system has all been around centralized parties. So, so often many of your viewers will hear about crypto and the subject of crypto, the idea of decentralized. And yes. really what that's saying is the computers and secret codes replace the need for there to be a bank or other centralized party to verify what the world has always needed verification for. I hope that helps a little bit. It wasn't yeah, too I think that's the part that scares or intimidates so many is that it's the first time we're considering, especially in this country, currency that is not tied to our government. Ooh, what a good topic that is. Yes. You know, we were talking off camera. Can I talk? Can I, yeah, share, with no. can I share with the viewers what we were talking about? And uh, it's interesting you say that. What an incredibly American notion that is, right? If you were born, uh, for example, I know you were born in Iran. We were talking about that. Uh, I, I know people that grew up in Venezuela, in uh, Argentina, in Israel, in Hungary, and the list goes on. There are literally 25 other countries where in the last 20 years, their societies experienced something called hyperinflation. Mm -hmm. Now, at the time that we're having this conversation, 
rightfully, the, the, one of the hot topics is the inflation going on in the United States. And stuff is more expensive than it was. There are really good reasons for that. That's not hyperinflation. Hyperinflation means you went to the Publix, uh, you know, yesterday and the cost of coffee was, you know, seven bucks a can. And then the next day you went in and the cost of that coffee was now $40 a yeah. can. Can you imagine? So the idea that there are people that grew up in different countries, honestly, they don't care that their money is backed up by their government because it became worthless. So for many viewers here that are, are, are American or grew up in the United States or now live here, the notion of what you said it has to be tied to a government is a wildly privileged American notion. Okay. And um, the other thing to think about is um, – we actually, many of your viewers, I'm willing to bet, actually do participate in a currency system uh, that doesn't involve uh, the governments. And we were laughing about this because it is at the core of many of the cases that you help clients with right now today. Now, full disclosure, I worked for American Express <laughs> uh, for a long time. And they created the first credit card membership reward program called uh, membership rewards. Okay. So every time you charge something on your Amex card, you get points. And so the funny thing about it is, is that when I talk to people about Bitcoin or crypto and I bring this up, I say, do you have an American Express card? Yes. Yeah. Do you use it? Yes, I do. Do you like your points? I do. Well, where are your points? Do you have them in your pocket? Are they in the house? Are they in the car? And so people go, no, they're just, you know, on my, you mean they're digital? You mean that they're, they're not, they're, you can't touch them? Have you used them for a trip or to make a purchase? And the point is, this is just one example of many around the world where human beings and societies have used something other than government money to have an economic system. So as you know, uh, in the state of Georgia, uh, points are divisible in a divorce proceeding. Yeah. They're also probatable if a family doesn't do a good job with their estate planning, too. So that's something to keep in mind. And also you can exchange them. So point systems, whether it's Delta Miles or whether or not it's American Express or other credit card points, they are a medium of exchange. Uh, they are a unit of account. They're a store of value. All fancy ways to describe our paper money, the U.S. dollar and every other paper money. And they all exist because of something called a social contract, which means that we believe in the system and whoever's backing it up. As card members of American Express, you believe that American Express is going to do a good job to ensure the integrity of those points. And they're not going to go tomorrow and say, yeah, those points, yeah, we're doing away with it. Too bad. So we all agree that we're going to buy into that. And as citizens of the United States, we buy into the notion that there's good faith that the American government will honor what I just shared as far as my dollars with somebody else. So there are lots of ways that people around the world exchange for goods and services. Cryptocurrencies are just one of the newest ways and one of the ways that is going to be around for the long term future that humans will exchange. So, Greg, this leads me to a uh question that could be a, very, a lot of help to a lot of our clients. Okay. A lot of um, legal professionals and are very good about helping their clients negotiate for their Amex points, negotiate for the, all the membership subscriptions that are out there, whether it's the Hulu, the Amazon, um, you know, all those things are, again, could be considered digital assets when we're splitting something up between right. our, uh, you know, two spouses. And a lot of what you get and what you learn about what your spouse has as far as assets or what the marital assets are depend on the quality of questions you ask during something we called financial discovery in a divorce case. That's right. So what is really important, I, I believe, for not just um, family law attorneys out there, but also informed consumers of family law services to understand is how is cryptocurrency such as Bitcoin? Because from your conversations, what we all understand is Bitcoin is one form of cryptocurrency. Sure. Um, how are these stored? How are they held on to? How sure. are they valued? If you could give us a little bit of background sure. there so that we can make sure 
we're asking quality questions for our clients and our clients are also asking quality questions of their spouses. What a terrific, what a terrific part of this conversation, because I think it starts, first of all, I'll answer it from the, with respect to the profession. And I think just like with any other evolution to a state law or any other change uh, in what's going on in terms of our, our, our legal system, attorneys, financial advisors, CPAs always have to educate themselves right. so that they can act as fiduciaries and be good stewards for their, for their clients. This falls into that same category. So for, for those in the profession that are tuning in, you need to have a general understanding of these emerging asset classes so you can advocate most effectively on behalf of your clients. But the good news is, is that once you have a basic understanding, it's almost the same types of probing questions need to be asked in that said discovery, okay? And uh, I can tell you that uh, since really 2016, 17, um, the, the, the type of assets in crypto that most people have that might be subject to being divided in a divorce proceeding are visible with relative ease. They're, they're, you, you ask a question, have you or haven't you? Tax returns are asking whether or not somebody has owned or did you own or have you owned at some point in time going back for the last couple of years. So moving forward, there is going to be more and more documentation. And the reason I say 2016 and 17 is the same types of rules that apply in the traditional financial world when opening up a crypto account, meaning uh, know your customer rules or what are called KYC provisions, apply in crypto almost universally for people here in the United States. Now, it's more complicated and you've got a uh, a, you know, you're dealing with a divorce situation where there's multiple countries of resident, multiple properties, you're going to have to dig deeper, just like you would have to dig deeper normally for all the other assets that are there. The, the one thing that is unique, and this is also something that you can bring to the light with good questions, is realizing if, in fact, uh, one of those uh, parties of the divorce was really uh, an early adopter of crypto. Did they, so questions you might want to ask is, did you ever mine your own cryptocurrency? Mine, M-I-N-E, just kind of like the uh, coal mining of the olden days. The way that many cryptocurrencies are created and generated is through what's called crypto mining. And so in the earliest days, if you have a client that was involved in a relationship or one of the parties was doing crypto mining, that may not be on the grid as much. It doesn't mean it couldn't be discoverable. It doesn't mean that they would be subject to perjuring themselves in a discovery, et cetera, et cetera. The reality is you have to ask those questions. I think it's a standard operating procedure question. Have you or did you ever, are you mining? Have you ever mined cryptocurrency? And where did you store that cryptocurrency? That's the follow-up question. And, and many people in the early days, they stored it themselves. In fairness, many people legitimately lost it. They forgot the code. Remember we talked at the beginning of the conversation, all that secret code? Right. If you forgot your part of the secret code, you can't, you can't unlock the, the money. You can't unlock the value. So um, you may be dealing with somebody that says, I forgot the code, and they may actually be telling you the truth. But... In many cases, it's critical that you ask those kinds of questions. You don't have to be a forensic crypto cryptographical expert, but you do need to be able to ask questions that could uncover uh, the types of things where you may retain those type of uh, cryptographic experts in a proceeding. So maybe that helps a little bit. That helps a lot. And I think it eases a lot of anxiety because one of the myths that I, I find a lot of our clients have who are married to somebody who is, um, you know, very big and investing in crypto, they're concerned as how am I even going to trace this down? So let's talk a little bit about the blockchain, because I think that's the part where if you understand yeah. that, you feel a lot better about that. The fact that this is actually traceable. Yeah, it, it is. It, it also speaks to some of the myths that are out there with crypto where it's only for illicit activity, only criminals transact in it. 
And what, what we know uh, is that actually, while you can disguise your, your uh, name using code, uh, where it goes and how you have to get that out into the real money, eventually people get outed, whether it's criminals or whether it's people that were involved in a divorce proceeding. If they, if they try and take that out, it can be tracked, it is traceable. And you brought up something that is really important. I mentioned earlier that the people that came up with the idea for this thing called Bitcoin, they, they said that you know there were these technologies that existed, but nobody put them all together. One of the pillars that allows crypto to work and one of the core technologies involved in many things that have nothing to do with coins or tokens, but are involved in the metaverse, which we may talk about at some point, et cetera, is something called blockchain. Uh, this is, as we laughed about earlier, this is an entire uh, curriculum for a semester, right? This is a really big topic. But let me, let me try and do my best to explain it to folks that when you hear blockchain, it's the modern version of keeping books and records the way that people have for as long as we've been exchanging goods and services. I mean, literally. You go back to the ancient worlds, they kept track of who bought what or who exchanged what or who bartered, bartered from each other by writing it down on a cliff. And then the Egyptians used papyrus to keep track of uh, one barge of grain for this amount of crocodile. You get the, you get the point. And then I don't want to scar people, but let's go back to our high school accounting 101s, right? You know, we had debits and credits. We had to write them in to keep track of who did this, who owes what, who spent where. Mm -hmm. And then we saw Quicken and technology and software help us with that. And what blockchain does is it, again, uses that, that computational power and code as a way to track the movement of all goods and services, have it validated through millions of different computers that are out there in the world in a way that is transparent and can never be changed, but it does it such that the people exchanging, whatever it might be, are not named. In other words, they're represented by code, not necessarily by the name. And that's a really radical idea. I told the story rather just kind of casually of, you know, people said we, we almost, the banks and all these trusted parties like governments, they almost ran the financial system right off the cliff. Well, that also is true. But these blockchain technologies truly have the power to disintermediate, to literally blow up the banking industry that has existed for thousands and thousands of years in one shape or form or another. What this means to your question is, no matter what, if it's on the blockchain, it never goes away. And so it may not be next week, it may not be a month from now, but if there's reasonable suspicion that somebody did have early crypto and they didn't disclose it, there are and will be ways that we'll be able to track it down. As a matter of fact, the government, the United States government will tell you, even though the headlines in the media would suggest otherwise and say that the biggest trends in you know, illegal activity and money laundering is crypto, it's not. It's actually a rounding error. What they'll tell you is that cash is still the best way for criminals to do criminal business because the government finds ways to track down all of that, that, that exchange when it's done with blockchain and crypto. They can't hide. And who has access to the blockchain? Who, who can actually go and review the transactions? Literally anybody that wants to spend the time and energy uh, to go onto the blockchain where you can view where every, every bit of crypto is actually owned. And then there are many businesses that have emerged there that actually uh, specialize in tracking down illicit movement between government entities, or criminal organizations uh, that are tracking where it goes. But I don't have any interest in doing it, but theoretically I could, or any individual that has access to Wi-Fi could go on to specialized sites and see where everything is. Now, again, that's a little bit too geeky for my personal taste. Right. I can't out on that, 
But but anybody has that's the whole point. Anybody has the ability to do it. And I think in the future, there'll be more and more businesses that specialize in crypto recovery, in originating, in seeking the origin of where it might be. Indeed, the private detective industry has already moved into the crypto sphere uh, for many, many different uh, reasons, not just for divorce proceedings. Yeah. So, Greg, in a divorce proceeding, if I had reason to believe that my spouse was uh, had transactions that they did not share in the uh, financial discovery, how could I use the blockchain to prove otherwise? Well, in that case, you have to be technically proficient and you could literally do it yourself to try and, and figure figure out where where it went. But it's really going to in all likelihood most of the cases you're going to come across, the vast majority, I mean the vast majority, they've had to disclose it because they've used exchanges. If they didn't mine the crypto and they bought it from somebody else, there is a transaction record that is also from the physical world, not just blockchain. In other words, the same way people buy stocks and bonds, they go to an investment company, they get a receipt, it's electronic, it's mailed in the paper, there is a transaction record of that. If you're involved in a marriage where somebody is a, a, a you know a, a citizen of a of a country that is uh, off of the grid, so to speak, that could you be. You mean like Iran? <laughs> I didn't want to go there, but yes, yes, you did, and I will second that. You I know, mean, I had I had to back you up there. You know, Iran, Iran is one of the major uh, miners of crypto. Uh, but it's actually the North Koreans, this is a side point, if, you, if now that we're talking about this, the North Koreans are probably the most organized and effective uh, state, a member a state, uh, you know, a, a country that is, is stealing crypto or using crypto to fund uh, their weapons programs and so forth because all the sanctions yeah. have prohibited them from using it elsewhere. That's a that's a that's a separate that's a good that's a good dinner conversation. But so but, it gives, but it gives you but it gives you an idea of kind of how this industry is going to birth many 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 other industries uh, that we think are important. Can I can I say something right now because we haven't talked about it yet? I want to for many people that are contemplating investing in crypto, I, I want to share something that's that's really important, and that is that. Um, uh, people need to be very pragmatic and use common sense, please. Uh, you know, we spend 100 hours a week uh, in this industry managing crypto investments for people. But even there, we're telling people 3%, 4%, 5% maximum is what folks should have at this time in what is a very early stage industry. Um, so again, from a divorce perspective, Remember that most of the crypto assets, they are going to have a paper trail, fi figurative or literal paper trail, the same way stock positions would have. So asking a few of the right questions will uncover it for sure. Yeah. And that's, uh, I also wanted you to t talk a little bit about just cold storage and Ooh. what different ways that crypto can even be stored. And yeah. Yeah, yeah so and this mean, goes back. What a great question. This goes back to some of the things you asked about earlier as well. So, when you think about cold storage and hot storage, it's basically the crypto language of where do, keep, where do people keep the code that represents the value of an individual crypto token or coin. So, in the case of Bitcoin, individuals have unique code that represents that amount of Bitcoin that they own. When you think about hot storage, that is when it is stored either on your computer or at another third party exchange, something you may have heard of like Coinbase, people may have heard of Gemini. And if you're watching the Super Bowl, you know, we're, we're, we're having this conversation a few days before the Super Bowl, the Super Bowl is gonna be flooded with crypto advertising. Any, most of those companies are what are called exchanges where they hold people's crypto as well. And anytime it's, it's, it's online or connected to computer, that's called hot storage, warm storage. When we refer to cold storage, it's not plugged into the web. 
meaning it's on a thumb drive or the equivalent of a thumb drive that people hold. Mm -hmm. Now, the thing to remember is when you hold that thumb drive, if you lose it, you've dead. lost the dough. Yeah. There's a, a famous case right now in the UK of an early, early crypto miner who owned literally hundreds of millions of worth of, of Bitcoin and other crypto. At the height of the crypto market in November of 2021, uh, his fortune on uh, this computer that he kept it on was almost a billion dollars. And then he erroneously realized he threw out an, a, a, a part of the computer hard drive that stored those keys and it went to a dump in England and he literally was raising a hundred million dollars to be able to buy the dump so that they could go in and try and uncover it and he would give up a portion of it to people who helped helped him find where this money was so there the, the safety tip is if you're going to hold it you know in cold storage yourself my goodness you need to put it in a safe deposit box or someplace where it's not going to be lost in a you know, a fire. We've heard stories where people that were victims of horrific wildfires also lost their storage uh, for much of their crypto that they were trying to wisely store offline. They ended up losing it because of that. So these are the these are the reasons why you need to have good advice and 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 work with professionals that can give you some counsel, just like anything else. Um, before I start asking you a little bit about how these things get transferred over or divided, um, whether it's in a divorce or in a probate situation, give me the ABCs on NFTs as well, just so I, you know, we've given up. No, I like it. This is great. <laughs> I know I'm asking you, yeah. you know, yeah. as, you know, long seminar level questions, but okay. you know, such a good job of just giving us the basic anchors that we need sure. to hold on to to understand a little bit more. Uh, an NFT is stands for a non fungible token. And what it means is unlike a currency uh, that is divisible and you could exchange or sell a fraction of a Bitcoin buy buy a fraction of another crypto. If you wanted to, an NFT is a unique permanent record of something. It could be a piece of, art, digital art. It could be somebody's identification, like a passport in the future. It could be the deed to property in the future. It could be famously NFTs. The, the, the thing that people think about mostly with an NFT is really the artistic side of the technology. But the non-fungible token is powered by something called uh, a smart contract which basically means software that is designed to do one thing or a couple of things only. But really what it does is it, is it establishes because the NFT resides where on the blockchain permanently for anyone and everyone to see who owns something. So it could be an image. So it could be a piece of collectible art. It could be, again, the deed to real estate, a home, or land. So in the future, many people, including myself, believe that we will no longer use paper to denote who owned property. Think of war-torn parts of the world right now where borders are fluid. Property becomes transfer because who had the stronger might? But, but being able to prove who owns something at a given point in time permanently has both practical use cases, but in the world of art and collectible, also has the same kind of use case as other art that is collected in the physical world. So, you know, for example, uh, back uh, almost a year ago now, Christie's sold a mosaic, a collection of all of the digital art by one of the pioneers in that space who goes by the name Beeple for $69 million US. And you might be saying, well, uh, why would I pay $69 billion for something that's digital? Well, the same question you could ask, well, why would you pay $69 million for one oil painting? Right. And it's whatever somebody has is perceiving the value of it. The reality is, is that it's technology. An NFT is technology 
that has code and is programmed to represent one physical thing without it being tampered with and it's not able to be changed. Other uses of NFTs in the future might also replace something called the title of property. So uh, many of us who've purchased a home have probably pondered, why do I need to have title insurance? Would it be, by now, shouldn't we be able to know who's got what? Right. Why am I paying wasted money? Literally, the title insurance industry is dead man walking. It's a, it's a dinosaur living amongst us right now because NFTs and that technology, the smart contracts that power them, they are going to replace it permanently. So maybe within five years, the notion of title insurance disappears. Gives you an idea. So everything from that to fine art and collectibles are using NFT technology in ways that people hadn't thought of just five years ago. Okay, that I think is, knocks NFT on its head at, at the most basic level that we can hold on to at this point. <laughs> so, <laughs> There's a lot. There's a lot there. Yeah, I'm going to ask you another huge sure. question, and I know you'll do just as brilliantly as simplifying it like you just did with NFTs. Uh, what the heck is the metaverse? <laughs> well, the gamers out there that might be in this audience, they already know that the metaverse while everybody's talking about it now, and largely because Facebook, in a stroke of brilliant public relations, in my opinion, decided to announce their name change at the peak of the scrutiny that they were receiving that was not flattering. Right. And a lot of people that have been working on metaverse projects are really aggravated. I would use more crass language, but uh, uh, this is a daytime conversation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The reality is they are not happy about it. The metaverse has been the notion that many people in the gaming industry have already existed in, which is that we could have a physical world and a digital world where we have communities and we take on personas and we interact and we transact business and we live a life that is in a digital world. And that's the best simplification of it. Some of you may be familiar with some of the early uh, gaming communities um, that were early pioneers in this notion of the metaverse, something called Second Life. Mm -hmm. Another one was called The Sims, which is still quite popular, where people uh, actually spend a lot of time engaging with other people in that Second Life, which is a metaverse, if you will. The meta really talks about the connection between the physical world and the digital world in all of these different universes, connecting them all together. And that's where many of the uh, technological investments and the projects that are going on are working to enhance that, to facilitate the seamlessness of it, to make it more lifelike, if you will. And honestly, in the last few years, when you go back to the early Second Life versions of that gaming community, to what the metaverse is like today, it's staggering. It's only going to get better such that you could exist in that metaverse professionally. You might give a lecture there on this topic in the metaverse in the future. Uh, you may transact business there. Attorneys may find ways to monetize their legal expertise entirely in the metaverse, but it all draws back to some of those early principles of human beings want to interact not just in the physical world. They want to interact socially, commercially, in what is called this, this virtual world, the meta is extending that to, to, uh, to encompass virtually all facets of life, but also the on and off ramps into that virtual world as well. It's very exciting, but it's very early, much like crypto coins and tokens are very, very early. And you're not going to, you ever, somebody will get rich quick, but most people will not, whether it's in crypto or tokens, or the metaverse. It's really important to think about that. And by the way, for those of you that are might be of my age and generation, plus or minus a little bit, you might be thinking, I would never spend that amount of time. Yes, you would. If you look around closely, if you see what the pandemic did to human behavior, more and more people are comfortable living in a virtual world. This is also the extension to the early internet chat rooms that people used to engage in. It's just taking that and adding nitrous to it and putting it on steroids for yeah, a while. The AOL chat groups is from our 
And, and you were, correct. And then people would say, well, what, what do you mean there's commercial opportunities in this metaverse? Well, right now there are people that are gaming enthusiasts that make incredible careers. They're financially independent because of their prowess at gaming. The, the fastest growing segment of spectator sports is watching professional gamers and teams of gamers. It's fascinating. And I don't, you know, again, I think if you're going to be in the technology space, as human beings, I think it's rather arrogant of us to assume that all the evolution in technology has just come to pass and we're done. As a matter of fact, it's only going to go more like this, in my, in my humble opinion. And so, you know, uh, all of us maybe uh, bought something or purchased something we thought was pretty important to us. And our parents or grandparents said, you're an idiot. Why did you buy that? Mm -hmm. Right. And so for a long time now in the gaming communities, people have been making purchases to individualize their avatars when playing these games. And of course, the fashion industry was on top of this very early. Uh, and so you have Louis Vuitton, some of the designers that are household names uh, for most folks today. They have created their virtual wardrobes for gamers and people that want to interact in this metaverse. So it's, it's a way of taking the traditional economy and bringing it there. And it's a way of interacting and doing and conducting business the way that we're doing it in the real world. We will find new ways and a, and a kind of combination of, of, of those, the merging of those two in this metaverse. I'm not sure if that was helpful, but that maybe gives you a, a better sense of the scope. But the notions of the technology that have become crypto and digital are in many cases 20, 30 years old. The notion of a metaverse, some people that were early adopters of Second Life, that's been around for a long time. It's just taking it to the next level. Well, no, I think, Greg, you're doing a great job of kind of getting us comfortable with what seems to be intimidating and uncomfortable by just saying, this is actually not as new. We've just chosen to ignore it for a bit of a time. That's, that's, a, that's a terrific, that's a very accurate. And, I, and, I, and now that it's taking over, I think um, whether you choose to be in it or not, personally, as a professional, I have to be ahead of these things that can impact the financial standings of my clients. And I, so to kind of go off of that, let's talk about the spouse who after division of assets throughout a divorce yeah. now is, has, it has been transferred, has been transferred over to him or her in, in cold storage or in hot storage. Yeah. Um, and either it's, you know, cryptocurrency or an NFT what next? What what do you recommend to them to do? Sure. Do they come and seek sure. somebody like you that can, you know, like Rubicon uh, Crypto that can help them steer through this? Yeah. Um, should they try right. to go and sell it? <laughs> if, if, you know, well, what well, do you recommend? Hard for me to advise on the specifics of when to buy or sell, but let me give you some guidelines. First of all, know thyself, right? If, if you're the type of individual that is leveraged wise advisors, legal counsel, CPA counsel, finance, CFP, financial advisors to manage your, your, your other dimensions of your professional life. The same really should hold true when it comes to crypto. If you're a do-it-yourselfer, then invest the time, the energy to understand, and you can continue to do it yourself with crypto. Okay. For us, when we founded the company Rubicon Crypto is because we saw this glaring opportunity that a lot of folks wanted to have exposure, the right exposure to these emerging assets, but they didn't want to do it themselves. And that the other products that were out there weren't very competitive and they didn't make a lot of sense. And essentially what my co-founders and I saw was an opportunity to come in and say, we spent combined over 60 years managing wealth for people in the traditional world. And we think there's a need for some common sense and some rational thinking in crypto and digital assets. And so what we did is we created Rubicon Crypto to basically take those same learnings, the same approach using professional management, deep research. As a matter of fact, I said it before, we don't have the market corner on the good ideas. We just signed a major research deal with the UGA math department to support and evolve our ongoing proprietary research. Because the amount of time it takes to study this, it doesn't eliminate the risk. It doesn't eliminate the volatility 
but we believe combined, it gives consumers a better chance to stand to benefit long-term from what these emerging technologies are. Again, a lot of hype around crypto. I'm probably generating a lot of that hype myself because we're talking, but the hype that I'm trying to bring to the conversation is common sense. No more than three to 5% total should go to crypto unless you are a technologist and you are 100 hours a week into this industry. If not, it is too much risk. There's too much volatility. And most folks, I don't care what they tell me, they're not as risk tolerant as they say they are. And that's why we, 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 we really insist. Sarah, it's really interesting. I spent my whole career becoming uh, worthy of managing all of the assets for a client, all the estate work, all the insurance work, and now I find myself telling clients, no, 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 only three to 5% because that's what's appropriate for people right now. So I can't tell a client or one of your listeners, you should buy it, you should sell it. Uh, but I do think they should seek counsel to determine what that, what that might look like. Oh, by the way, crypto is regulated. And when you buy and sell crypto, it is taxable. <laughs> okay. So... Just final question I have to ask for the sake of so many clients, and then um, we'll wrap this up. Sure. What if I, can, I um, inherited a digital asset like an NFT yeah. or crypto, or I came, across, you know, I gained it from a divorce proceeding, and I want to go and buy, you know, let's say my 16-year-old a car? Can I take my um, this digital asset to the to the car lot and buy a car with it? Yes, you can. And that may be either the best or worst decision you might ever make. So it depends on, it depends. So for example, we've heard publicly Tesla accepts Bitcoin now uh, for a purchase of their automobiles, yet very few people are buying them. I know that Wharton, a very highly reputable business school connected to the University of Pennsylvania, they will accept uh, crypto as far as uh, their tuition payments. But most people are holding on to their crypto, uh, especially Bitcoin, because for a lot of the reasons that are unique to Bitcoin that we don't have time to get into, people believe that Bitcoin, and you, you could use gold to buy a car too. It's just not very efficient. And many people view Bitcoin as being the equivalent of digital gold, okay? Meaning it's more of a store of a value than it is being used for an exchange right. of, of transaction. But the short answer to your question is, yes, you can. Depends on who it is. Some people are, uh, but that may prove to be, look, if crypto becomes, and I don't believe this, but if crypto is ultimately proven to be completely worthless, like some naysayers believe that it is, if that's the case, making that transaction was the best thing you ever did. More likely, if you did that today and Bitcoin rose to the levels many people believe that as we do, that it will go to, it'll be the most expensive car you ever bought. <laughs> so it just, it just depends, honestly, it just depends. There could be a tax reason why you might want to uh, use that to, to offset other, you get the point. Yeah. So it's a complicated question. I know we're on a, running out of time, so I hope that was helpful. That was great. Um, and I think, again, just brings common sense and some practical thinking, which has been a great theme to learn from you today on all of this. Yes. Greg, t tell us where we can um, find you or um, look up sure. Rubicon um, uh, sure. Crypto and what, wherever you, however, whatever message you want to give to any prospect that is looking at this and saying, whoa, I didn't know I could actually have a yeah. digital asset manager. Yeah. That's pretty cool. Yeah, thank you for doing that. First of all, you can find us at rubicon.crypto.com. Again, that's rubicon.crypto.com. Um, you can also find us on LinkedIn for a lot of professionals. LinkedIn is our, our preferred social media platform for the time being. And so you can find me, Greg Johnson, CEO of Rubicon Crypto, very easy to find me. We have uh, an ability you can schedule an appointment to have an exploratory conversation. And right now we're doing that with folks uh, of all shapes and sizes because we believe we have a responsibility to help educate uh, folks. And we'll, we'll let you know if it's inappropriate. I can't tell you how many times people want to put too much into this, Sarah, and that is the kiss of death and we just won't do it. But we also believe, 
And I'll leave you with this. You have to ask a couple of big questions before you should consider investing in any type of cryptocurrency or, or tokens, if you will. And the first question you have to ask yourself is, do you or do you not believe that in five, 10 or 15 years, our, our human world will be more dependent, more entwined in tech? And that should be a rhetorical question for everybody. Mm -hmm. Like I said earlier, it's rather arrogant to assume that this is it, okay? All right, so we believe, yes, it will be more. The next question is, are you already seeing, especially through COVID, where human society will become more and more digitally, meaning working in a digital capacity in the metaverse and doing many, many things in a digital capacity? And if the answer to that question is yes, now have a conversation with, with, with somebody that you trust, hopefully it's Rubicon Crypto, about whether or not it's appropriate for you. Those are the big questions you need to ask first, though. So happy to chat with anybody. Thank you so much, Greg. That was so educational. Thank you all for listening. And um, hopefully you learned as much as I did. I thought that was crazy. Um, just gave me the anchors I was looking for. That's oh, I'm so glad we covered a lot of ground. You asked some big questions. So <laughs> thank you very much for the opportunity. Thank you, Greg.